You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey guys, welcome to another awesome episode of Ask Drone You. I'm your host today, Paul, and welcome to episode 434. I've got a very special guest on today. Who is he? Well, he's a droney just like you, but he's been doing it for quite some time. Way before there were drones, he's been flying, well, pretty much whatever he wants to. He's that good. But today we want to bring him on the show to talk about how he acquired a nighttime koa. He's able to fly his drone at night. And as you know, most people under the part 107 can't do that. So here's Tom Kilpatrick. Welcome, Tom. Hi, Paul. Thanks a lot. Hey, thanks for being on the show. Really appreciate it. You know, I just want to say congratulations on being one of the first guys to have a nighttime flying koa. How cool is that? It sounds like the simplest thing in the whole world. Hey, you get to go fly your drone at night. We've all seen great firework videos at, you know, around July 4th and all that, New Year's Eve. And it sounds like the simplest thing in the world to do. I'm just going to launch my drone and go fly around. And if I monetize it, if I do it for commercial purposes, what's the harm in that, right? Well, <laughs> the FAA doesn't think it's quite that simple. So uh, we, we had to, uh, we, we, we've had a 333 for heck a year and a half now, longer than that, I, uh, a little over a year now, I guess. And we've had our 107, got that right when it came out on uh, the 29th a month ago. So we wanted to, before we got our 107, to add on <clears throat> the night operation, night authorization to our 333. So we started this process a long time ago. Gotcha. So we've been working on this. This just wasn't a thing that we've worked on in the past month. Okay. So when you got this nighttime co, is it for your 333 exemption or is it directly applying to your 107 operations? Or what you're saying is it was written for 333, but passed the mustard to be 107 compliant? It is specifically for the 107, and we didn't request that at all. It's just the FAA decided, you know, we're moving in the direction of 107. We FAA are moving away from 333. We're just gonna we're just gonna go ahead and, and grant this for 107 operations. So we don't have the 500 foot setback requirements. We don't have all those other things under 333 that you do under 107. Additionally, the most important thing that we all like about 107 is that you can fly to the height of a structure plus 400 feet. And that is almost allowed here, although our specific uh, uh, night authorization only gives us an additional 200 feet. So I don't know if that's universal in all the night exemptions or if it's just specific to ours, but that's what we got is top of the structure plus 200. Interesting. So let me ask you this, just to take a step back really quick. When did you actually file for the COA itself? We, we filed on June 8th for this, and this is right after, and I, I forgive me, I don't recall the name of the company, but it was the, the American subsidiary of a Toronto-based company. They were awarded the first nighttime authorization in the United States. We were working with a utility company at the time, and they needed night op authorization for routine line maintenance plus emergency operations. We're in Oklahoma City. We get everything from ice to tornadoes and now earthquakes. So if we were going to operate on their behalf, we knew we needed to be able to do it at night. So we dropped paper at that time. I like how you say, and now earthquakes. <laughs> Just throwing that in there. <laughs> so we get a little bit of everything. We don't have locusts yet, but I understand they're on their way. Oh, great. <laughs> well, honestly, I have to say it's really awesome. Are there any other specific things that you've noticed in that COA that limit your operations that are differentiated from normal 107 operations? It is specific to Class G, Class Golf. So if we wanted to operate in Echo, Delta, Charlie, and certainly Bravo, we would have to seek a waiver, I suppose, to our waiver or our waiver of authorization. And, and, I, and I, I've got it right here, but I assume that you can go and link to it on the website. Mm -hmm, maybe yep. So everybody else can have the benefit because on Facebook and Twitter, I've had a lot of people who have said, hey, where do I get a copy? How can I look at yours? And, of course, we're glad to share that with everybody in the community. Um, you were able to find it faster than us, but we've been out in the field this morning. So. <laughs> well, yeah, so, it's... yeah. So people will find in here that we're limited to class golf unless you waiver the waiver. Uh, and then, uh, then you, the waiver. you're wavering the waiver or you're authorizing the authorization. Yeah. Uh, so, but then you have certain crew briefing requirements you have to check, and you have to survey where you're going to be operating, lights, of course, things like that. 
Wow, very interesting. So let me ask you this. When you're actually setting up, you're doing the operation, is there anything that you have to do differently as far as, you know, an area that you kind of cordon off? And I don't even know if you still do that uh, with your 107 operations. I do. I still have a huge cordon off area, you know, that for, for takeoff and landing. So is there anything operation wise when you're getting up and going as far as the night ops go that you're doing differently? And another question too is, are you using any specific lights like the loom cube to act as your anti-collision lights? What are you using, Tom? Um, that's a great question. Let me answer those in the order that you asked. And I'll come back to the lighting that we use later. In fact, we put <clears throat> up on Vimeo this morning a video we recorded yesterday showing uh, how the light is installed, what it looks like in operation close up. And, and so uh, I'll send you that link. And so you can connect that if you'd like. Or if you just want to Google us, Cloud Deck Media on Vimeo, you can probably find that. It's open available for anybody to take a look at. Um, but your, your original question, what do you have to do to survey the, the, the launch location and the flight environment before you do it? Uh, and I'm looking here <clears throat> at sections 7 through 11 of the waiver, and it says um, number... Uh, number seven, all operations under the waiver must use one or more visual observers. And last night we, we had one official visual observer assigned, but we had two other people that were just monitoring. Uh, and if you like, go through real quickly what these are, and you can come back to in detail. Number eight, um, we must ensure that the remote PIC and VO are trained to recognize and overcome visual uh, illusions caused by darkness. Uh, number nine, both the PIC and the VO must ensure the area of operation is sufficiently illuminated to allow both to identify people and obstacles, or they must conduct a daytime site assessment prior to operations. Number 10 of 11, <clears throat> the, the SUA must be equipped with lighted anti-collision lighting visible from no less than three statute miles. And then lastly, number 11, in addition to the requirements, it must not fly higher than 200 feet above the structure's immediate uppermost limit. So the wonderful thing that we all like about 107 is you can go to the top of a structure plus 400 feet, so long mm -hmm. as you remain within 400 feet. And so this provides for that. Now, we just we capped our operation at 400 feet AGL last night, so we just kept it real simple. Nice. So, Smart. Anyway, so, those, those are the specifics. So going back to the lights, what kind of lighting system are you using, you said? We used a, gosh, I don't have, it's on the drone, in the car. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a four LED strobe that draws power from either, you can either hardwire it in, which we don't, uh, or you can power it off of either double A's, I believe triple A's, or nine volt batteries. So we just did a three double A battery pack on it and uh, and Velcroed it to the back with some, with some really robust Velcro. So... In that video, you'll see how that's attached. Okay, very and we cool. Also have specs on the uh, on the lighting itself. And that lighting. that was my next question: is are there specific specs that like you know someone should look for to know that hey this light will actually reach three miles? You know, like some uh, luminosity number, you know, something because. Uh, you know, it's hard to tell, especially when you're buying stuff online. Like, is this even going to comply? You know. Yeah, that's right. And they say it's specifically for UAVs, and it says, you know, and, and it does what it says it does. So we got 2,000 feet out, and, uh, and, and we started getting a, a weak uh, signal connection with a remote. So, and that's okay. We didn't need to be further out than that because you're, what, four-tenths of a mile out anyway in mm -hmm. night operations, and you've got media standing there. So you really don't want to make any mistakes. So we yeah. got 2,000 feet. Parked it there at 400 feet, got some great skyline shots, and then sent that uh, screenshot off the iPad to the reporter as well. So I we saw a little bit of the news last night, but I haven't seen much of the broadcast since. But that That's was good enough cool. for us. You got to be proud. Just flashing away. So, see, this is one of the questions that was brought up even just a few a uh, few days ago on the podcast was someone says, "Can I use the Loom Cube as a strobe and then mm -hmm. turn it down?" Uh, to actually be used as a light at the same time because I believe the 107 law does say that the strobe can be turned down uh, in uh, brightness for a specific reason, um, but it was my understanding that you can't use the strobe, the anti-collision strobe, and then turn it and face it down and actually use it to light a subject as well because that was kind of the question, can you use it for both? And my understanding is that no, you can't do that, but maybe I'm wrong. 
I well, okay, I'm going to do something really scary. I'm going to act as both a lawyer and an FA administrator, and I'm neither. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but I will tell you this: as a pilot, what I would want to see if I was a manned aircraft, if I was flying a manned aircraft, either fixed wing or helicopter in the area, I would want to be able to see in the best possible way the anti-collision lights of a drone or another aircraft, and and I would not want uh, to run the risk or have the fear that that anti-collision light might be directed in another direction for the benefit of the operator. I understand that, but if you need to do that, like landing lights on a manned aircraft, Mm -hmm. well, if you need landing lights, then install landing lights. If you need anti-collision lights, do that, but don't confuse the two. Let me go specifically to the wording of of the authorization, and it says, the remote PIC may reduce the intensity of the anti-collision lighting if he or she determines that because of operating conditions, it would be in the interest of safety to do so. So turn down so, doesn't mean turn off and redirect. No, it doesn't at all. Yeah. And and I know this is a man pilot being instrument rated. If you're flying in the clouds and you've got your strobes firing, it will totally blind you because they're reflecting off the moisture around you. That's not the purpose of 107 because you've got to be in visual meteorological conditions, of course. Mm-hmm. But for whatever reason, that's kind of the, 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 the FAA providing us with a latitude using judgment and intelligence that if for whatever reason you need to turn down the intensity if you can – then you have the, the, the authorization to do so. Gotcha. But as far as we're concerned, we're going to have those things firing as brightly as possible. Awesome. Such good information, Tom. Seriously. Are there any other points that you want to kind of hit with people if they're thinking about getting a nighttime authorization? Um, I will link uh, your COA to the podcast so people can see it. Yeah. But is there any, any information or any special details you may want to share with the community? Yeah, crew resource management is something that's really critical. The ability to work with uh, between a VO and a PIC. What's really important is crew resource management between the PIC and the VO. They need to understand, for example, if the PIC is looking heads down at the screen and the VO is providing optical separation and looking at the environment, what they're supposed to say at all times. We have that briefing before every flight. We had one a little while ago in which one of our uh, PICs was operating. And even though under 107, you're not required to have a visual observer, we do this for most of our operations. This is daytime, clear in a million out there. And so what we do, one of the things that we do <clears throat> is I'll stand next to the PIC. And if he's approaching a wire, for instance, I'll say wire in three, two, one, zero. And when I get to zero, that's not the moment he would contact the wire. That's the moment he needs to let off the sticks. Gotcha. Interesting. So I just do a simple call out of what the threat is. It could be wire, tree, building, bird, wall, whatever it is. One word, tree in three, two, one, zero. And then he lets off the sticks, and he's got the braking ramped up, and whatever the UAV is, it should stop at that time. That's sim- so you guys are normally flying, just to clarify and, and provide uh, environmental information, that's if you were flying in GPS mode. He lets off the sticks, active brake kicks in, and you stop moving. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Now, if he's in Addy mode and it's full manual, then you know uh, what, what I'm telling him is that he needs, he needs to provide enough braking, manual braking, or divert the trajectory to mm-hmm. do that. Most of our operations, actually, we use GPS. Interesting. Yeah, well, I'm a, I'm a big manual flyer. I, I don't like the whole, you know, when I'm doing video and I'm moving with GPS and I stop and then, whoo, 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 you know, I like the whole <laughs> float mm-hmm. on, as we like to say. Um, but yeah. it's interesting. I, I really appreciate that because uh, one of our other flight instructors, uh, Ted Wilson, he is a certified flight instructor with the FAA. He was in mm-hmm. Oak City, I want to say... Uh, I think that was the beginning of August and they were doing a bunch of crew resource management and he came into class and he's like, you know, I just got a big talk from the FAA about this. I'm really happy that you touched on it here, Tom. So thank you very much. Any last words for the, for the community at large, anything else if you're flying at night? Other things on the, uh, on the nighttime aspects and also surveying the flight environment. One is that you need to understand, uh, people need to understand that your night vision is critical. So you can't come right out of an illuminated car and look to the sky. You're, it's going to take a few minutes for your eyes to settle in. Also, you're going to have powerful strobes, at least one, that could overpower your ability to see in night. So don't look at it. Also, when you want to focus on an object at night, you can't look right at it. 
you have to look just to the side of it because in the back of your eyes the optic nerve is pretty much right at what you're looking at so you need to know these things also if you're exhausted if you're dehydrated your night acuity is going to go down you need to understand all those things number two the flight environment the FAA requires that you either need it needs to be illuminated or you need to go out there in daylight conditions and survey it. And we do that, both the PIC and the VO. So we'll go out there. We did yesterday around 5 o'clock and took a look and said, okay, we've got wires there. We have trees over there. We've got – and then all the other buildings around were illuminated. Those weren't hazards. But we knew all that before we launched. Gotcha. So those are cool things. Awesome. Tom, thank you so much for your time. I know you're a busy man. I know you're in between projects, but we really do appreciate your time and all the useful information. Hopefully the information you've provided will help other people be able to fly at night, but also fly safely at night, which is what we're all about. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Tom. And guys, that's going to do it for our show today. If you have a question, go to askdroneu.com and upload it right away. But that's going to do it. So I'll talk to you later.